In this lesson, we're looking at another triangle congruence. So remember that in module five, we talked about angle side angle triangle congruence. We talked about side angle side triangle congruence. We talked about side 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 triangle congruence. And now we're exploring uh, the validity of angle angle side triangle congruence. So in this explore, it's asking us to use a compass and straight edge to copy segment AC. So remember that that is the easiest possible construction that you could be asked to do. So anytime you're being asked to construct a copy of something else, remember that you start with a random ray. So there's my random ray. And I'm going to label this end point of it E. And on E, I'm going to copy segment AC. Remember how you do that. You set your compass setting to the length of AC. And then putting the point of my compass at this end point, I mark it on my random ray. And now I call this F. So the next thing it asks us to do is to copy angle A using EF as a side of the angle. So remember how you copy an angle. So they've got this marking here, but my compass won't close that far, plus I want you to see the whole process. So I'm going to open my compass setting to just a little bit bigger. And so I'm making a random arc on my angle. Notice that it is going through both sides of the angle. Notice that I made that arc, putting the point of my compass at the vertex of the angle. And then I copy that onto where I'm copying the angle to. The vertex of my new angle will be E, so that's why I'm, the point of my compass goes to E. And then I come back to the angle that I'm copying, and I make my compass setting this distance. Notice that the point of my compass and the point of my pencil are both on points of the random arc I made. Notice that they are on the two sides of the angle. So I take that compass setting and bring it over here. Notice where the compass point is. It's not on F. It's on this point that my arc created. And then I mark it. So now this angle E will be congruent to the angle A I started with. Next thing that they're asking me to do, now we're on part C of this explore activity, it says on a separate sheet of a, a separate transparent sheet or tracing paper, copy angle B. Okay, so I'm going to copy angle B since it's tracing paper, I'm just going to trace it. And the instructions tell us to make the sides of the angle longer than the sides of the triangle. So you notice that I went a little bit further. And then it's saying, now overlay the ray from angle E, which is here with the ray from angle G, which is here, to form a triangle. Okay. So this ray on my tracing paper needs to overlap this one. And I want to make sure that I'm crossing F. Okay, so this is very important, this is very important, and so is this. So I'm coming down the angle until I cross F. So in order for it to copy over, I'm going to trace it on both sides. Remember this trick. 
I'm tracing on both sides of the tracing paper so that when I trace it again here, it's going to copy it over like magic. And so here is G. And now if I look at triangle ABC and triangle EGF, triangles are congruent. Let me make that more clear. If I trace this triangle and overlay it on triangle ABC, you'll see that they line up. So how many triangles can we construct? One. And the triangles are congruent. And we could say that because of rigid motions, In the first reflect question, they're asking, suppose we had started the activity by copying segment BC and then angles A and C. Would the results have been the same? Why or why not? Well, let's come back over here. So notice what we ended up copying. We copied segment AC. We copied angle A. And we copied angle B. So notice I have two angles and a side. But this is not angle side angle because notice that the side is not between the two angles. So we say that it is the non-included side. So if we had done BC and then angles A and C, that'd be BC and angles A and C, the result would have been the same. I still would have a side and two non-included angles. So would the result have been the same? Yes, it's still a side. Let me put it another way. It's still two angles. And the non-included side. So we have angle-angle side congruence theorem. If two angles in the non-included side of one triangle are congruent to the corresponding angles in non-included side of another triangle, then the triangles are congruent. And so we just did an explore to kind of justify that, and here we're doing a proof of it. Okay, so we know we are given that angles A and D are congruent. So we notice that that was copied over in the proof. We are given that angles C and F are congruent, so that's a blank that we're expected to fill in. And that segments B, C, and E, F are congruent, so that's stated in the given. And then I have that angle B plus angle, I'm sorry, angle A plus angle B plus angle C equals 180. Remember, that's the triangle angle sum theorem. And then it says that the measure of angle B, therefore, would equal 180 minus angle A and minus angle C. So what they did is they subtracted angles A and C from both sides of the equation. Similarly, I know that angle D plus E plus F equals 180. Same reason, triangle angle sum theorem. Similarly, I can take these two angles, angles D and F, and subtract them from both sides of the equation so I can get E by itself. Uh, since I know that angle A is congruent to angle D, that's why I know that their measures are equal. Same thing with angles C and F. Since they're congruent, I know that their measures are equal. And that's the definition of congruent angles. So I know that angle E equals 180 
minus, notice what we did. We substituted angle A and angle C in for angles D and F respectively. So that's the substitution property. And that means since angle E equals 180 minus angle A and minus C, and angle B also equals 180 minus angle A and angle C, that means that angle E has to equal, that's a typo, angle B. And they're saying it's the transitive property. I'd rather you thought of it as substitution. But a lot of times, textbooks and assessments will use them interchangeably. But it is more properly substitution. So since I know angle, the measure of angle E is equal to the measure of angle B, again, I can use the definition of congruent angles to say that since their measures are equal, I know the angles will be congruent. And so let's take that piece of information and mark it in the diagram. So now that I have that, look at what we have. We have these two angles congruent to these two angles and these two included sides. So that means the triangles are congruent by angle, side, angle, triangle congruence. So we've proven angle, angle, side using angle, side, angle. This is a very convenient property that I'd like you to make a point of. It's so convenient. Let's highlight it. It says that if I know two angles of one triangle are congruent to two angles of another triangle, the third angles theorem is the name of the property. And it allows me to conclude that the third angles of the two triangles are congruent. And how could this be used to simplify the proof of angle, angle, side congruence? Well, I could have saved myself all of, I could have saved myself all of this with the uh, third angle theorem. I could have jumped straight from these two angles, these two pairs of angles being congruent, straight to here using the third angles theorem as my re reason. So I could have made this a three-step proof rather than a 10-step proof. Okay, so how could using this theorem simplify the proof? It could let us skip steps two through eight. I really like this question. Could the angle, angle, side congruence theorem be used in the proof? Absolutely not. Using what you're trying to prove in order to prove it is circular reasoning. It's like saying the sky is blue because the sky is blue. It doesn't make sense. Don't do it. But now that we have proven angle, angle, side congruence, now we can use it. So in example two, part A, they've given you a proof, and let's just kind of talk through it. So we are given a pair of sides that are congruent, so I'm going to mark them off in the diagram. We are also told that M is parallel to N. So that's these two lines. Notice that the arrowheads indicate parallel lines. I can use the parallel lines to say, ooh, you know what, I really don't like what this book did right here. It called this angle E. But there's like five different angle E's in this diagram. So I'm going to be more precise and say that this is angle DEC. That's this angle. 
in the market with an arc is congruent to this angle, angle CAB. So that's this guy. They are alternate interior angles. Notice that they are inside of the two lines M and N. Notice that they are on opposite sides of this transversal. Similarly, and the book made the same mistake of naming these angles with only one letter. Don't do that, please. Angle B would more properly be called angle CBA. Let me try to make that a little bit neater. Will be congruent to angle EDC. also because of alternate interior angles. Let me mark them. So the triangles are congruent by angle-angle side. We have a very similar proof here. So we've got a bunch of things arrowing into uh, different places. What I'd like you to realize is that these two parts of the given have to go here because they allow us to conclude eventually that I'll have some congruent angles. This part of the given goes directly into what we're trying to prove of the two triangles being congruent. So I'm going to take this and put it in this bubble. CB is congruent to ED. I know that line segment CB is parallel to ED and that segment AB is parallel to CD. So notice how up here our reasons are under our bubbles. Let's do the same thing in our proof. So this is given, this is given, and this is given. So because CB is parallel to ED. Notice this angle and this angle, how they are both on the same side of transversal AE. Notice how angle CED is above line DE, just like angle ACB. That makes them corresponding angles. So our reason is the corresponding angles theorem. Since I know that AB is parallel to CD, again, I still have this transversal. That means that angle A or angle BAC will be congruent to angle DCE. So angle BAC will be congruent to angle DCE. Same reason, corresponding angles theorem. And I never got around to marking that CB was congruent to ED. I just marked that they were parallel. But now we see that we have in example three, we're doing the same thing. This time we're in the coordinate plane. Notice that we are given that angle A is congruent to angle D. Since BC and DE are horizontal segments intersecting with BA and EF that are vertical segments, you know that these are both right angles and all right angles are congruent. So we can find the length of AC and DF using the distance formula. So you see that they identified the coordinates of A and C and then plugged them into the distance formula. Now, I'm not a big fan of these examples because they are choosing the hardest way to do this problem. Because I hope that if 
I asked you this question, you would not look at this segment and this segment and try to find their length to compare them. You would look at AB or BC or DE and EF because they're a whole lot easier to find the length of. Horizontal segments, all you have to do is count the spaces. Same thing with vertical segments. Okay, so that's why I'm not going to go over this example B that they have because, once again, they have you doing it the absolute hardest way possible. Look at what they have. They have angle P congruent to angle Z. Okay, they have angle Q uh, congruent to angle X. And then instead of doing what any common sense citizen would do, which is find the length of this vertical segment and this horizontal segment and compare them, no, no, no. They've got you using the distance formula. That just doesn't make any sense. Okay, so that's why um, I'm not doing this because they are going about it in the absolute... In this your turn example, however, I don't have a vertical segment or a horizontal segment, and so I do need to use the distance formula. And since distance formula is something that you always want to have somewhat fresh in your mind, let's go ahead and do one of these problems. So let's mark off the information that we have. I know that angle A is congruent to angle D. I know that angle B is congruent to angle E. And since the instructions are asking me to use angle, angle, side, I am not going to find the length of AB or ED because that would be angle, side, angle. Um, let's go ahead and, oh, the instructions actually tell us to compare BC and EF. All right, well, B is located at negative 5, comma, 5. And C is located at negative 1, comma, 2. E is at positive 1, comma, 2. And F is at 5, comma, negative 1. Okay, so the length of BC... The square root of negative 5 minus negative 1 squared plus 5 minus 2 squared. So that's the square root of, this now becomes negative 4 squared plus 3 squared. So that's 16 plus 9, which is 25. And when I take the square root of 25, I get nice pretty 5. That's convenient. Let's compare that to EF. The length of EF is 1 minus 5 squared plus 2 minus negative 1 squared. So 1 minus 5 is negative 4 squared, oh, looking interesting, plus 2 plus 1 squared, so that'll be 3 squared, equals square root of 25, equals, so since BC equals EF. These triangles are congruent by angle, angle, side.